Good morning. How's everybody today? Good. We are glad to have you with us for worship. Welcome to Grace Valley Christian Reformed Church. If you're our guest, we are very glad to have you with us as well. Uh, we hope that you feel welcome. We hope that you feel a part of our family uh, through our worship and through our fellowship this morning. If you are on YouTube this morning and are able, unable to be with us in person, we are glad that you have found a way to be a part of our community as well. Worship is all about giving worth to someone or something. And so we gather together on Sunday mornings to give worth to God, to show him how much he means to us. We give our time, we give our talents, we give our offerings, we give our prayers as a way of showing our gratitude to a God who loved us and saved us and made us something that we were not. And so I want to begin worship today with a psalm of thanksgiving, of gratitude for what God has done. I'm going to read Psalm 16. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their name on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. Nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You will make known to me the path of life. And you will fill me with joy in your presence. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. Will you pray with me? Lord, the eyes of all look to you in hope, and you give them what they need. You open your hand and satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. We turn to you again this morning, longing to be filled, to eat the bread of life, to drink from your life-giving streams, to taste your goodness and live. May the time we spend together in your presence nourish our hearts and our minds. May it strengthen our relationship with you and renew our commitment to live as faithful disciples in this world. For you alone are God. For you alone are the source and sustainer of our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. We stand for a blessing this morning. May the grace, mercy, and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. There is no rock, there is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved, he's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock, there is no God like our rock of Jesus is the rock, rock of ages. Jesus is the rock, rock of ages. Jesus is the rock. There is no rock, there is no God by God. There is no rock. There is no God like our God. No other name worthy of all our praise. The rock of salvation that cannot be moved. He's proven himself to be faithful and true. There is no rock. There is no God like our God. Rock of 
courts. Better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts and a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts, better is one day in your house, better is one day in your courts and a thousand elsewhere. A thousand elsewhere. spend some time praying together this morning. Um, but before we uh, jump into our prayer, I want to give you guys a chance to share any prayer requests that you might have so that we can um, include you in that prayer and include you in our prayers this coming week. Do you have any prayer requests to share this morning? Yeah, John. All right, John. Uh, John's niece, Lainey. Asking for prayers for her, having a rough time. Get a message from Kathy Schweigert this morning that Gary is positive for COVID. And so uh, she's pretty concerned about that because she's got heart problems and everything else. So pray for him and pray for her. Anybody else? Yeah, Steve. Uh, Steve and Kim's uh, guy that works for them, Ed, has also been going through some personal stuff, so they're asking for prayers for him as well. Yes, Chris. Good. Thank you. Yes, Chris has been asking for prayers for a coworker that has cancer and uh, it's gotten some good reports. It's not progressed as they feared it had, and treatment is going well for her. So we're very thankful for that. Is that it? All right. We're going to spend some time praying through um, part of Ephesians 2 this morning. We'll use that as a template for our prayer. So I'm going to read verses 12 through 22 of Ephesians 2, and then uh, I will lead us in prayer. Um, from that text. Paul writes to the Ephesians. He says, Remember that you were at one time separated from Christ, 
alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. You had no hope and were without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, thus making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and he preached peace to you who were far off, and he preached peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into the holy temple in the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Let's pray together. Dear God, we come to you as your people. We come to you as your people who you have um, transformed, you have put your spirit in us, you have sent your son to die in our place, and we come to you in reverence for all that you have done in our lives. And there's uh, so much evidence of that in this text. You transform our identity. You give us new hope. We can be reconciled to each other through your blood. You abolish division. You create oneness. You reconcile relationships and produce a lasting peace. You transform all enmity between us. You make us fellow citizens and saints and members of your family. You unite us and build us so that together we reflect your holiness in the world. And so, dear God, for all that you've done, we offer prayers of praise. Thank you for what you did on our behalf. Thank you for reconciling us to you and to each other. Thank you that in you we see new possibilities we see walls being broken down. We see differences be mended. We see forgiveness and reconciliation happening. We thank you for the peace that is available to us through your spirit. We thank you that you are the cornerstone. You are the, the one that holds us all together. And we thank you that you have the strength to do that, even when we do not. Lord, we also come to you in confession, knowing that even though we have access to so many things through you, we don't always use your gifts. We don't always trust in your work. And so we confess that we need you to bring peace in our hearts. We've, we've let our minds be um, consumed by fear and anxiety and worry. We've um, become addicted to control. ask for forgiveness for all those times. Dear God, we ask for forgiveness for our doubts, for the lies that we've believed about you, about ourselves, about our neighbor. We ask forgiveness for the false narratives we've let infect our thoughts. We thank you for forgiving us. Thank you for promising that 
We no longer have to hold on to that guilt and shame, but we are made righteous in you. Dear God, we come to you with requests, knowing that you have promised to give us our daily bread. You have promised to give good gifts to your children. And so we pray that you give us grace today to stop believing lies about ourselves and to embrace our identity in you. We pray that as we live in a world that more and more seems to be turning away from you, help us to be agents of peace and reconciliation. Dear God, we pray for for those who need to see you, need to experience your love, need to know that you are close by. Many that we are concerned about, many that uh, we want to hold up before you, that you would work powerfully in their lives. For John's niece, Lainey, for Ed, for Chris's co-worker as she continues to go through treatment, for Gary as he's recovering from COVID, no other families who have had it as well. We pray for uh, the regaining of strength. God, we pray that your holiness will prevail in our lives, in our communities, and in the world. That your spirit will be evident through your people as we are built together into a holy and beautiful temple for you. Dear God, you promised to lead us out into the world. You promise to work through us. Empower us so that your peace triumphs over evil. As the world seeks to divide us, help us to live with one heart and one voice and one mind and one purpose. As we journey together, in a society that believes less and less about you. Help us to believe more and more in the truth of your word and in the truth that you are the cornerstone, that you are the one that is holding everything together. Help us to live lives of gratitude. As we turn to your word, help us to hear what we need to hear. Help us to be renewed again by your love and your grace for us. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask the deacons to come forward. We're going to collect an offering now that will be used for the ministry of our church. And as they make their way forward, uh, let me pray that God would bless these gifts. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you. You've given us so much. And we trust that with these gifts, Uh, You would do so much more than we can imagine that you would help more and more people to come to know your love through the work of your people. In your name we pray. Amen. He taught me how to 
you have a Bible with you, turn to Luke 18, and if you have a catechism book, we are on Lord's Day 32, and there's a transition in the catechism this week, so I thought we better do a quick test, see if you guys have been paying attention, we've been in the catechism for seven months already. And so, does anybody remember what the first uh, big section of the catechism was about? Guilt and sin. So, it was, yeah, it was early in the year. I think January and February, we spent like two months talking about sin and its impacts on us and its impacts on the world. We needed to really understand um, how much sin um, has a hold on us. And so that's the first section of the catechism. And then we just finished the middle section. Does anybody know what the middle section was about? Salvation, yes. Who knows the G word? Grace. Okay, good. So the middle section is about grace and salvation. Um, And we, we spent like four months talking about Jesus and talking about the gospel and talking about how through his life and death and resurrection, we have new life in him. And now finally, we are rounding the corner. We've made it to the third section of the catechism. And do you know what the, the third section is about? Gratitude. Good. Gratitude and service. And so we're going to spend uh, the rest of July, rest of July, August, September, October, November, talking about gratitude. This is the section of the catechism that answers the question about what now? If we believe that we have sinned, if we believe that we cannot be saved on our own, and if we believe that we can only be saved through Jesus and we've accepted that, how do we live? How do we live in response to that? And this is a dangerous section of the catechism. The path we will need to walk over the next several months is very narrow. As soon as you start talking about obedience and following the law, you can get into dangerous territory pretty fast. There's deep cliffs on either side of the path. Paul talks about how much freedom we have in Christ. And Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And so we hold both of those things in tension. There can be danger in in being too lenient, saying everything is permissible, I've been forgiven for everything, and so I'm going to do what I want. Sometimes we start to think, well, if God is good and loving and gracious, and the death of Jesus has paid the price for all of the sins, and there is no sin too great that Jesus won't forgive it, then why not just do what you want? can do whatever I think will make me the most happy. Because if I screw up, he'll forgive me. It doesn't matter. Paul asked this question in Romans 6. He says, shall we sin more so that grace may abound? 
Maybe if we just commit more sins, then God just has more opportunity to forgive us. We can do what we want. The quote that is sometimes attributed to uh, someone named Heinrich Heine. And he said, I like to sin, and God likes to forgive, and so the world seems to be admirably arranged. If God is going to forgive me anyway, I might as well get my money's worth. Maybe you know someone like that. Maybe you've been someone like that. It's one of the, the cliffs we need to be careful of. That's not how God wants us to live. There's another danger. There's another cliff on the other side of the walkway. And that's that we become too obsessed with doing what is right. We become too worried about uh, following the letter of the law. And we become so obsessed with our own righteousness that we lose sight of the grace that we have been given in Christ. We become so concerned about everything looking right and being right that we forget about grace. And so we're going to spend several months working through uh, passages like the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer that are going to help us learn how to live in gratitude for what Jesus has done. That life of gratitude, that life of thanksgiving is going to be the handrail that we hold on to as we walk this tight path. It'll be the way that we know that we're doing it properly, is that we're doing it from a place of gratitude. And so we have uh, question and answer 86 today that's going to be kind of an introduction to this gratitude section. Uh, let's read that first, um, and then we're going to uh, jump into this text in Luke 18. So I will read the question, I believe it will be up there, and then if you would read together with me the answer. So the question that the Catechism asked today is, since we have been delivered from our misery by grace through Christ, without any merit of our own, why then should we do good works? The answer is, because Christ, having redeemed us by his blood, is also restoring us by his spirit into his image, so that with our whole lives we may show that we are thankful to God for his benefits, so that he may be praised through us, that we may be assured of our faith by its fruits, and so that by our godly living our neighbors may be won over to Christ. So there's three reasons here the Catechism says uh, why we should live godly lives. This story in Luke 18 is sort of a contrast to that way of living. Um, and so we're going to read this in a minute. It's a fairly simple parable, but before we get into it, I want us to try and forget everything you know about the Bible. Because he's going to tell this parable about a Pharisee and a tax collector. And you guys, um, most of you have spent quite a bit of time in church and reading the Bible, and so... Um, if Jesus is going to tell a story about the Pharisee, is he going to be the good guy or the bad guy? If Jesus is telling the story, he's going to be the bad guy. You guys know this already because we've done this before and you know what's happening. And so it's like a, 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 a murder mystery that you already know who did it at the start of the movie. Like it's just, there's no tension left because we already know what's supposed to be happening. But Jesus tells these parables and he's trying to um, get them to think one thing, and then he's going to reverse it at the end. And so we need to try and not think about the Pharisee as the bad guy because the people who are listening to Jesus, the Pharisee would have been the good guy. And the Pharisee is the guy who was very devout. He um, was very pious. He um, took the Bible very seriously, more seriously than anybody else. He's someone who would have been well-respected in the community. He's like a, a good, solid business person. He's like, a, like the, like the Chick-fil-A guy, the Hobby Lobby guys. Like people, the Christians start out with like this border baseline respect for these guys because they don't open on Sunday, right? And so, so every, all the Christians like, oh, those are good guys. That's what the Pharisees were like. These are good guys. And so you start talking about the Pharisees, that's what we need to think about. He's the guy that's uh, on the board of the rescue mission. 
He's the first one to make a pledge to the church building fund. The farmer who never plants or harvests on Sunday. Pharisees are the good guys in the New Testament world. You would have wanted to be like them. They took their faith seriously. They took the word of God seriously. The tax collectors did not. The tax collector's job was to collect taxes from the people. How many of you is uh, April 15 one of your favorite holidays? Enjoy writing that check to the government. No hands, no hands. It's bad enough when you have to just write the check and put it in the mail. It comes out of your bank account. But what about if a guy came and knocked on your door and said, I'm here from the government. You owe $2,000. You going to invite him in for coffee? Share a meal? This is not a guy you're going to be happy to see. Tax collector, that was his job, was to collect taxes. But in the ancient world, they just didn't collect the taxes. Uh, part of the way that they made their income was by charging extra. So if you owe $1,000 in taxes and I could get you to pay $1,200, then I just made a quick $200. And so the tax collectors are, are Jewish people who are working for the Roman government, the enemies, and they're exploiting their own people to get rich. So these guys have like three strikes before they even start. And I was trying to think of like a modern job that would have the like cultural disdain that a tax collector in the ancient world does and I was having a hard time um, there's some someone said like they have a little bit of like a, a mobster mafia feel to them because they would like do whatever they needed to do to collect their money but um, there's a little bit of that but that doesn't quite work because they're not working for the government and we don't quite have the sort of um, hatred of the government as they would, the Jewish people would have in the Roman world. We have some like healthy skepticism, but generally we have some uh, recognition of its utility. And so um, I couldn't think of anything that worked. If you got ideas, let me know. I'd like to hear them. But um, so there's the good guy, the Pharisee, and there's the bad guy, the tax collector. And imagine they both come into church on Sunday morning and the Pharisee sits on one side and the tax collector walks in and he sits on the other side. And so what do you think when that tax collector walks in? This mafia boss comes and sits in the front row. Someone that you know is not living life the way you think he should. Someone who has shown no respect for the ways of God. And he comes and sits in the front row. What do you think? You think, huh? Maybe God's doing something. I'm sure glad he's here. I want to go spend some time with that guy after church. Or are you a little worried? You keep your distance. Hope he leaves quickly afterward. These are the guys that Jesus tells this parable about. So let's read it, and then we'll unpack it a little bit. Hopefully that helps us to sort of reset uh, who we're talking about in this parable. Luke 18, verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. He said, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and he said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So we're going to mostly talk about the Pharisee today because the Pharisee is acting in contrast to that question and answer we read from the Catechism. This is a, a simple parable, but it's a little bit unique because Luke tells us right off the bat who this parable is for. It says, Jesus told this parable to those who were confident of their own righteousness and they looked down on everybody else. And so what we see 
in this Pharisee, this um, guy who was confident in his own righteousness and looking down on everybody else, is that um, his prayer and his um, participation in the temple that day was about him looking good, not about God looking good. He, in his prayer, is pointing at himself, not God. His actions, his prayers, his attitude are all about him. There's a look at me quality to what the Pharisee is doing. He is good. He knows it. He wants to make sure you know it too. Last week we talked about Peter's confession of Jesus as Lord and that uh, the most basic understanding of the gospel, the most basic posture that we can have as Christians is the one that Peter had and that was when he pointed at Jesus and said he's the one. The text here says the Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. It's a good indication your prayer is not going the way it's supposed to go if you pray about yourself. This prayer is a prayer about how good the Pharisee is. I thank you, God, that I am not like those other people, the robbers, the evildoers, or even this guy. This is not a prayer of gratitude. It's a prayer of arrogance. He doesn't need grace. God has a little bit of a part in it. He made him different, but, um, but he doesn't need any more. He's got it figured out now. I wonder how often our prayers are like this. We might still admit that we sin a little bit, but at least I don't sin like those other people. Thank you for, for, for making me not sin like them. We might think our sins are smaller, less obvious, which makes our need for grace seem less obvious. And so it shows up in our lives as thinking we are better. Ever find yourself looking at somebody else and thinking, I think I might have been able to do a little better with what that person has been given. I think if that were me, I'd have made some better choices. Or if only that person would have listened to me, They'd be so much further along. It's the opposite of the gospel. The Pharisee says, look at me. The gospel says, look at Jesus. The Pharisee is focused on himself. It's like someone who wins an award and stands up for an acceptance speech, and they, they hold up the trophy and they say, I'm really glad I won this. I'm pretty sure I'm more deserving of it than everybody else. If you guys hadn't picked me to win this award, I'd have, had some, I'd have lost some respect for you guys because clearly I deserve this. That would be awkward, right? It's not what you're supposed to do when you win an award. Even, even if you deserve it, it's an opportunity to acknowledge the people who helped you get there, to acknowledge that it wasn't done on your own. It's a chance to recognize how much others have sacrificed so that you could be there. You can't be acting out of gratitude if your goal is to be in the spotlight, if your goal is for everyone to be looking at you. You can't be living out of gratitude for what God has done if your posture is always, look at me. The gospel is that Jesus died to save sinners, and likely I am the worst of sinners. Then we can't just be saying, look at how good I am. The gospel prayer isn't the prayer that says, thank you that I'm not like the other guys. The gospel prayer is the prayer of the tax collector. Have mercy on me, a sinner. You can't live a life of gratitude for a gift if it's not a gift at all. You don't think of it as a gift. That's the first thing that we see about this Pharisee. He wants the attention on him instead of God. The second part is similar, but instead of just um, wanting the intention on him instead of God, he says, thank you that I am not like the other people. Thank you that I'm not like the evildoers, the robbers, the adulterers. And so now he's saying, uh, putting the attention on what he has done instead of what God has done. So not only are we not looking at God, we're looking at him, we're not thinking about what God has done for him, we're 
looking at what he has done. He goes on to say, I give, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. He says, look at all the good things that I do. He's not concerned about what God has done. He's not even recognizing what God has done. He's not recognizing that um, the only reason that he is not like those other people is because God has been working in his life. What he is saying is he is better than these other people. He deserves recognition because he is not like them. This is an easy danger to, to hold also. That we receive God's grace, and that grace becomes a source of pride, and it becomes a source of us thinking that we're better than somebody else. God sure is lucky to have us on his team, isn't he? We think that we are more deserving of the love of God because we're not like those other guys. And you can't have this sort of attitude if you understand the gospel. Because part of believing the gospel is believing that we are just like those other guys. But the difference isn't that we are like them. The difference is that we have come to know Jesus. We are just like them. We could have been just like them. It's not us who are different. It's Jesus who is different. And he lived and died in our place. And we trust that God loves us not because we are different, but because he was different. Living a life of gratitude is going to mean we talk more about what Jesus has done than about what we have done. Catechism says that we live lives of gratitude so that God can be glorified. The Pharisee is praying so that he can be glorified. The third thing that the Pharisee says, is he says, thank you that I'm not like that tax collector. I could be a lot of bad things, but that's kind of the worst. And I'm really glad that I'm not like him. It's not just that he thinks he's better, but he's like outwardly condescending and mean. Like, just. I can't even believe that guy's here. What is he doing? We should probably just kick him out. And this shows another misunderstanding of the love of God. It assumes that there are limits. It assumes that there is scarcity in the love of God. It assumes that there's some sort of supply and demand situation going on. That if this other person gets some of God's love, then I might get less of it. It assumes that in the kingdom of God, just like in the world, our job is to get to the top and make sure we can get our cut of the love of God. The gospel says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. And so we don't need to compare ourselves to others. We don't need to make sure that we have a better resume or a better record of church attendance or inviting people to church. I don't think there's a scoreboard in heaven pretty sure we're all going to be on the same team when we get there. We can't be living a life of gratitude if we treat the love of God as something that's going to run out, as something that can't extend to the people we don't like. Catechism says that if we are grateful for the gifts of God, then our lives get lived to help others see the gifts of God as well. Jesus says you are the salt of the earth. But the salt in the salt shaker isn't doing what the salt is made for. You might have the best, most flavorful salt in the world, and if you put it in a jar and keep it on your shelf, nobody's going to know. And so salt needs to be put on something. It needs to make something better. Gratitude works that way as well. If we believe the good news of the gospel, that we used to be lost, but now we're found, that we used to be dead, but now we're alive. That we were separated from God, but, and that now have been brought into his family. Then we should be shouting it from the rooftops. We should be celebrating it like no one else. We should be rearranging our lives to get close to others so that they too can know what we know. The life of gratitude looks like pointing at God, not ourselves. 
It looks like talking about what God has done, not what we have done. And it looks like loving others so well that they see the life of Jesus in us and want to live life fully the way that we do. <clears throat> Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, and I end with this verse from Paul. He says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each one of you should give what you have decided to give in your own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, and their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Do we believe that the gifts of God are indescribable? Do we believe that they are unlimited? Do we believe that there is enough for everyone so that we live lives of overflowing generosity and gratitude? Will you pray with me? Dear God, I thank you for the indescribable gift we have received through your Son. Help us to remember its depth, its breadth. Help us to remember how easily we could have been like those people we often look down on. And that the only reason we are not is because of you. Keep us looking to you. Keep us pointing others to you. Give us the love that you have for our friends, our neighbors, our community, and the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand and join us in singing our last song. I heard an old, old story how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save wrecks like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Beneath the cleansing blood, I heard.
heard about a mansion he is building in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing and the old Steal your mic. Got it. <laughs> All right. Uh, Saturday, corn boil. Going to be fun. Uh, we do have a few places that we need signed up for still, I think. Is that right? Uh, so check the table on your way out. And uh, Doug wanted to do a quick announcement about setup on Friday. Kathy told me this morning that uh, Friday night setup nobody has signed up and I said wow imagine that <laughs> this is this was at one time uh, a men's event but it's become more than that so kids and ladies if you want to come and help set up chairs there's plenty of things to do set up chairs tables we've got tents tents to set up and things to do outside so um, we will provide a, a, a meal, some hamburgers and chips and stuff like that. So if uh, you want to bring in a family event or um, whatever, you can come and join them in a meal when we're all set up then afterwards. Also, um, what next What week, time? 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock. Uh, and you, even if you don't sign up, you can still come. <laughs> you know, and if you do sign up, I won't call you or come and get you or anything. <laughs> so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty open. Also next week, we would like to have our vegetable wagon or our vegetable cart is sitting on the corner of the uh, lot over here and it hasn't had anything on it yet this year. Um, the vegetables and stuff are, are later this year, but if you have any extra, we will have it out and available for the corn boil for people to, um, to pick up some stuff to take with them. So if you have stuff, bring it on Friday or Saturday to the corn boil and we'll put it on the trailer for our, for our guests and if we have leftover, then you can just take it and go. But All right. Thanks, Doug. Uh, we do have also one more thing coming up. It's going to be a busy next month or so. Uh, VBS is happening also in a few weeks, August 7 to 11. So there are some um, registration forms up there um, by the table as well. You can grab those, share them with people who you think um, might want to come to Bible school. Um, but there's also a list of donations that they need and uh, some places that you can volunteer for Bible school also. So check that stuff out at the table as well. And uh, there's still some meals in the freezer. We'll make sure we remember that that's out there by the gym door. Uh, there's still several meals in there. Grab them. Find a reason to give somebody a meal and uh, share it with them this week because uh, guys probably fill that up again soon, huh? Not this month? All right. Take them anyway. We'll figure it out. <laughs> All right, let me give us a blessing as we go. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and by his grace gave us an eternal encouragement and good hope also encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen.